بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا ورزقنا علما تنفعنا به آمين رب العالمين الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله We've reached our next lesson in the tafsir of the short surahs of the Qur'an course. And today, bi Allah ta'ala, we will be discussing Suratul Masad. Suratul Masad, which translates to the palm fiber. First and foremost, before we go into the, the tafsir uh, and the discussion on uh, the surah itself, there is actually a reason for the revelation of the surah, as we have with many other surahs of the Qur'an. Um, so we find in a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, which is narrated from... Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went out to the, the valley of Al-Badha and he ascended the mountain over there. And this is also, in other hadith it mentions, the Mount Safa, right, the famous Mount Safa. Um, and he cried out to the people, Ya Sabaha. So he went out and he ascended the mountain and he called out to the people, he called out to the Quraysh. And he said to them, Ya Sabaha, which basically means, oh people, come, come and listen, come out. And so the Quraysh, they gathered around him, they came out to listen to what he had to say, right? And we have to understand and remember that the status that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had in his community, among his people, was of a very high status. He was born from the best of the Quraysh. His grandfather was a very well and popular man, Abdul Muttalib. And his uncle Abu Talib was the man of status, his uncles, you know. So, and, and not just that, his character itself, he was known as Al-Amin, the trustworthy one. And he was known as the best of the, of the best. And this uh, is well known, alhamdulillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it such that he had this, this special place in the hearts of the people. Due to his personality and not just his status as in his lineage and so forth. So he called them, and this is of course after prophethood, after many of them had now rejected him and turned away from him and, and started to scorn against him and so forth. And so he said to them, if I said to you, O people, that the enemy was about to attack you or that they are planning to attack you from behind this mountain in the morning or in the evening, would you believe me? That I'm standing on above this mountain and behind me there's an enemy that's about to attack you in the morning or in the evening. Would you believe me? And the people, what did they say? They said, yes, we believe you. Because of his status and, and his, his personality and his character. And this is how it was that the Quraysh, they, they had no reason not to trust him. So they said, yes, we believe you. Because we know that you, do not, you are not a person who lies. You are not a person who makes stories, make up stories and so forth. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, فَإِنِّي نَذِيرُ لَكُمْ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ عَذَابٍ شَدِيدٍ Indeed, I am a warner that has been sent to you before the coming of a severe torment. Subhanallah. So, meaning the message I am bringing you as a warner from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent me is much more severe, is much more serious, is much more important than me informing you of an enemy that's about to attack you. This torment that's going to reach you, that, and if you don't accept this message of mine, the torment that's going to reach you will be much more severe than that of an enemy attacking you, even if it's a surprise attack. And that torment, of course, especially would apply to in the Akhirah, Wallahu Musta'an. But still they refuse to, they refuse to accept. They never understood what he's saying. Or perhaps they did understand, but there were many reasons why they never accepted. So Abu Lahab then stood up. And Abu Lahab, we know, was his uncle. Abu Lahab then said, is this what you gathered us for? Is this why you gathered us here? Is this why you called us? May you perish, he said to him. Tabban lak. May you perish, he said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent down the surah, Tabbat yada abi lahabiw wa tab. Tabbat yada abi lahabiw wa tab. May the hands of Abu Lahab perish, and he himself perish. So what we find is, he comes and he insults Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he belittles Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he belittles his message. His message. And he abuses him and curses him in fact. And he says, may you perish. 
and Allah then defends his messenger. Allah then revealed the surah and this, this ayat in defense of his messenger responding to Abu Lahab. So before the Prophet could even respond, before any other companion could maybe respond, before anybody else, maybe a family member, like Abu Talib, for example, who defended Rasulullah before anybody else could respond in defense of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah Azza wa Jal reveals ayat to defend his messenger and to insult the one who insulted him and to curse the one who cursed him. And he said, Tabbat yada abi lahabim, batabba. May the hands of Abu Lahab perish and may he himself perish. And so subhanallah, this surah, this is why the surah was revealed, number one. Number two, this surah is also one of the many surahs and ayat of the Quran by which we see the clear evidence that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was truly the messenger of Allah. Because in this surah, there is also a direct challenge to Abu Lahab and his wife. Because Allah speaks about them. And Allah mentions things about them. That they may, may be perished. And you'll see the ayat that speaks about his wife and so forth. And how they will be thrown into Jahannam. The point is, these ayat were revealed towards the early parts of prophethood. Meaning Abu Lahab lived on after these ayat were sent. If Abu Lahab wanted to spite Allah and his Quran and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he could have said, I accept Islam or his wife. So how can you say I'm going to be thrown into the fire? But yet Allah, of course, knew through his divine wisdom and knowledge that this man is never going to accept Islam. And so Allah sent these ayat. And this was an evidence to show the people that he's not going to accept Islam and he's going to enter the fire. So subhanAllah, this ayat was also like a prophecy that's going to come through. Or words and, 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 and information from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is going to happen and there's nobody that can change this. Not even Abu Lahab himself. So these are also ayat that proves that what was sent to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was truly divine. It was wahi. And that he was the true messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another narration, it states that Abu Lahab stood up, dusting off his hands, and he said, May you perish for the rest of this day. He said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Is this what you gathered us for? May you perish for the, the rest of this day. And he dusted off his hands. And this is why Allah then said, Tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tab. May those hands, and may the hands of Abu Lahab be perished, and may he perish himself. So Allah started mentioning by the hands that he, he was dusting. Allah said, May those hands perish. And may Abu Lahab himself be perished. Subhanallah. So who was Abu Lahab? It's important for us to understand to understand the, the power of the surah and the context of the surah. It's, we have to know a little bit about Abu Lahab. Right? Abu Lahab was one of the uncles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His name was actually Abdul Uzza. Abdul Uzza bin Abdul Muttalib. So he was the son of Abdul Muttalib. Right? Which means he is the paternal uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yani Rasulullah's father was of course Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib. This is his brother, Abu Lahab, or also known as, or actually his name is actually Abdul Uzza. His actual name was Abdul Uzza, right? The son of Abdul Muttalib. Al Uzza was of course an idol that they used to worship back then, a false god. Um, so he's the slave of that false god. Remember, they were, these people were not upon Tawheed, right? Uh, before the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is why they had these type of names, right? His surname was Abu Utayba, or one of his other, his kunya rather, not his surname. His kunya was Abu Utayba, as his son was Utayba. And he was only called Abu Lahab because of the brightness of his face. So the word Lahab means uh, something that's flaming or shining or, or blazing and so forth. So this is why he was called Abu Lahab, because of his face, because of the way he looked. And so because of his, his shining face, you can say, or his bright face, right, or his blazing face. Perhaps we shouldn't say uh, bright, his blazing or his, his, his reddish face. Understand? Like, like that of a fire which becomes reddish, right? His cheeks also would become red at times when he became angry or he became a little bit worked up and so forth. 
So this is why he was called Abu Lahab. Because Lahab means something that's blazing. So his cheeks would become red as if he was blazing. Right? And this is one of the reasons he is called Abu Lahab. This was his nickname in the dunya because of the way he looked. He had a face that was uh, bright and shining and also uh, uh, blazing, like, like, like becoming red and so forth. And it's known that he used to harm the, the, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is of course well known. He hated and scorned him and his religion. He hated him and he scorned him and his religion. So in reality, he, there was no personal hatred to the messenger of Allah. Meaning before prophethood, he had no problem with the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what did he actually hate? He actually hated his deen. He hated what he came with of tawheed. Of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and abolishing shirk and idol worship and the worship of all the idols that they had in Mecca at the time and all of the false gods that they had in Mecca at the time. And this is what they actually hated and this is what they refused to accept even though it made sense to them, even though they knew he's a truthful person and so forth. But it's the truth that he came with that upset them. And many of them were, were people who were, uh, they were muta'asib, or meaning they had Tribalism firstly, and also they were fanatical towards their people and the religions of their forefathers. And this is what they refused to give up. So they refused to change their belief, right? Even though the haqq had been presented to them, even though there were so many evidences to them that this was the truth. But because of their arrogance, because of their egos, because of their fanaticism towards their tribes or their forefathers and so forth, this is why they refused to give up. This is why they refuse to accept the truth. And this is evident with many of them, with many of the Quraysh. And th that this was the main reason what prevented them from accepting Islam. And this is what Abu Lahab hated about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in many cases he would tell him, you sworn our forefathers, you belittled our, our, our intelligent ones, our religion, and so forth. This is what they, he constantly complained about to Abu Talib, who kept defending his, his nephew. And he complained about to the Prophet and he threatened him with and so forth. In a hadith recorded by Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, in his Musnad, that a man called Rabi'ah ibn Abbad from the tribe of Bani uh, Adil was a man of pre Islamic ignorance. This man accepted Islam. Right? He said to him that I saw the Prophet, so this is narrated from Abu Az Zinad. That this man accepted Islam and he said to him, I saw the Prophet وسلم, during the days of Jahiliyyah, before, um, meaning in his days of Jahiliyyah, right? So the Prophet, Prophet who had now come, the Prophet was going out and giving da'wah. So this man was still in his time of Jahiliyyah and he saw something and he saw in the market of Dhul Majaz that the Messenger was saying, Ya ayyuhan nas, qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. O oh, people, say la ilaha illallah and you will be successful. O oh, people, say la ilaha illallah, there is none worthy of worship except Allah, and you will be successful. So the Prophet wasallam is out in this marketplace giving da'wah, inviting people, and people would come and listen to him, and, and, and you know, hear him out. And this is what he was basically saying to them, giving them the da'wah to la ilaha illallah, so that they will accept Islam, and become muahideen, and then this will be their success. So the people gathered around him, and behind him there was a man with a bright face, right? This man with a bright face. He was cross-eyed or squint, and two braids in his hair. He had two braids in his hair. And this man was saying, إِنَّهُ صَابِئْ كَاذِبْ إِنَّهُ صَابِئٌ كَاذِبٌ إِنَّهُ صَابِئٌ كَاذِبٌ He is an apostate, and he is a, a liar. A sabiq is what they used to call the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A sabiq means someone who left our religion. Someone who left our deen, they used to call him a sabi. So they said he's a sabi, he's left our deen. And he's a kathib, he's a liar. He was now, as the Prophet is giving da'wah, he's walking behind the Prophet and he is countering his da'wah by saying the man's a liar and he's an apostate from our religion. And this man followed him wherever he went. So I asked who was he and the people that then said to me, this is his uncle Abu Lahab. This is his uncle Abu Lahab. Another narration in the Sahih Ibn Hibban adds that he, where he said that there was a man following him around, throwing him with stones, pelting him, Yarmi bil Hijara, Yarmihi bil Hijara, throwing him with stones until 
his hamstrings and his ankles were bleeding. So throwing him with stones and you could see the blood flowing down, you know, at the, at the areas of his ankles and his, and his hamstrings, his Achilles tendons in those areas, those areas over there, you could see blood flowing from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's Mubarak legs. And this was of course from who? From Abu Lahab was throwing him with stones as he was doing da'wah, Allahu al-Musta'an. So this is just one example of the, the enmity that he showed and the, <coughs> the abuse that he showed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shaykh ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah, he mentions that when it comes to the uncles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and their relationship with him and Allah, their relationship with him and his deen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they are of three types. The first type the Shaykh mentions is they are those who accepted the deen. They accepted Islam. And they became worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they strove hard with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in establishing this deen. That's the first category of uncles that he had. Another category of uncles that he had was those who supported him. They defended him. They assisted him. However, they remained kuffar. Yani they did not accept Islam. And the third category of uncles that he had was a category of those who abused him, those who were stubborn, those who completely opposed him. Right? And of course, they were also disbelievers. So of the first category, those who believed in him, we have, of course, Al-Abbas, Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the son of Abdul Muttalib, and also Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, for example. These two uncles became great companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were his uncles, but we also say, radiallahu anhum. May Allah be pleased because they were great sahaba. Allah be pleased with him. Especially Hamza. Al-Abbas had great virtue as well. And of course, Hamza. Hamza, for example, was martyred in the battle of Uhud. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cried and wept for Hamza. Who was also, by the way, his nursing brother, his milk brother. Right? They were nursed together. They were similar age. And he said, this is Asadullah wa Asadul Rasul. Upon his death, he said, this is the Lion of Allah and the Lion of the Messenger, radiallahu anhu. The second category, we of course have Abu Talib. Abu Talib, who became his guardian at the death of Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather. Abu Talib then looked after him and was his guardian. And he loved him extremely. And he was extremely fond of him. So he supported him. He believed in him. Yani that this, this nephew of mine is truthful. And he also defended him against the Quraysh. And there's great narrations about this. Subhanallah of how he, the extent that he went to in defending him. Such that he would threaten those who threatened the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That he actually was willing to take revenge against them. That if they harmed him, he would come and take revenge against them and kill them. This was mentioned in certain narrations of, of how much Abu Talib loved him and was willing to defend him. Um, but still, unfortunately, Abu Talib did not die as a Muslim. And on his deathbed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is there saying to him, Oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah. Encouraging him on his deathbed to say la ilaha illallah. And he said to him, this is a word that I will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you with. I will intercede on behalf of you. And with this word, if you say it, the statement, but on the other side of the bed was the likes of Abu Lahab. Saying to him, are you going to give up the religion of your father? Are you going to deny the religion of your father? And this is, as we said earlier, one of the main reasons why they refused to accept Islam was because of their loyalty to their families or their, fa their, their, their forefathers and so forth. And this is all Abu Lahab said to him. Are you going to give up the religion of Abdul Muttalib, your father? And he then did not say la ilaha illallah and he did not accept Islam and he died upon the religion of Abdul Muttalib which was not upon the religion of Tawheed um, unfortunately and upon this uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ayat to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying innaka la tahdi man ahbabt walakin Allah yahdi man yasha that verily you O Muhammad indeed you cannot guide those whom you love rather it is Allah who guides whomsoever He wants. Meaning, guidance is not in your hands, O Rasulullah. You may be the messenger of Allah, but you do not have the ability to guide whomsoever you want, whomsoever you are pleased with, whomsoever you love. 
It doesn't work that way. Rather, Allah yahdi man yasha. Subhanallah. So the second category would be Abu Talib. The third category, of course, would be the likes of Abu Lahab. That's right, so a no doubt Abu Lahab is of the third category. And Shaykh Ibn Sayyidin then said, Allah then even revealed a surah about him. Speaking about him, not in a good way of course, insulting him, cursing him. So Allah reveals a surah cursing him and his wife and condem condemning them to the fire of Jahannam, which is of course an insult to him, a major insult to him, and also a challenge that he refused to, or that he was unable to respond to. But yet, for us to recite the surah, the Sheikh says this is a surah that's recited daily in the salawat. The short surah, so people recite it often. In the fard salah, in the sunnah salah, out loud, uh, silently, people are always reciting the surah. And the Sheikh says for reciting the surah, we will get reward. And for every letter, we get ten hasanat, ten good deeds. Walhamdulillah. Yet the surah is of course a, a response to Abu Lahab and a condemnation of Abu Lahab, walhamdulillah rabbil alameen, as he was the enemy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah azza wa jal, he says, tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tab, tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tab, may the hands of Abu Lahab perish, and Abu, may he himself perish. Um, and on this point, before we move on, Abu Lahab, we say was definitely a nickname that was befitting for him, because we explained earlier what Lahab means, means something that's, you know, blazing or, or reddish or flaming or, 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 or bright. As we said, his, his face is to become like this, and that's why they called him that name in the dunya. But the nickname is also appropriate for him for the, for the akhirah, because he is now the father of that blaze, the father of that blazing flame. And that is where he is, that, we, that is where his abode. In the, in the akhirah, that's his abode. His abode is nothing but the blazing fire, Wallahu Musta'an. So definitely Abu Lahab, the father of Lahab, the father of that blaze, is not just appropriate for him in the dunya, where he had a blazing face, but also in the akhirah, where you'll be in the blazing flames of the fire of Jahannam, Wallahu Musta'an. In the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَا لُهُ وَمَا كَسَبَ Neither his wealth, nor worldly gains will benefit him. Right? Firstly, we look at this ma in the beginning of the, of the surah, right? Now, we know in Arabic, there are different types of ma, right? We have, we have different types of the, of the word or the letter or this half ma, right? It has different functions and different types. Of them is the ma ul istifham, the ma of questioning, right? Where you use ma in front of a sentence to, 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 to use it as a question, for example, um, for example, uh, in, in one of the questions of the grave is going to be, وَمَا دِينُكْ وَمَا دِينُكْ And what is your religion? So, ma yeah, in this context is a question. وَمَا دِينُكْ What is your religion? What was your religion? Right? Ma is used as a question. Another type of ma is ma nafiyah Is the ma of negation. The ma of negation to negate whatever is, is, uh, comes in the sentence. So in this ayah over here, Sheikh Ibn Taymin, for example, says that this ma could either be ma of istifha, a ma of question, or it can be ma of nafiya, the ma of negation, right? So for example, if we say this the ma of istifha, the ma of questioning, then the translation would be something like, would his, or can, will his wealth or worldly gains be of benefit to him? It will be a question. And the answer, of course, would be no. Right? And Allah, there are many ayat like this where Allah SWT, he, he gives us a question. And when the, whereas the answer is well known. It's a rhetorical question. Right? So it could be a question. ما أغنى عن ما وما كسب يعني as a question, would his wealth, will his wealth and, and worldly gains be of benefit to him? And the answer is well known that it's no. Or it can be nafia, which is how most would interpret it, saying neither his wealth nor worldly gains will benefit him. Negating any type of benefit, negating, this is the amount of negation, his wealth, nor his worldly gains will be of benefit, right? So both of them are applicable according to the Shaykh, uh, and as we can see in terms of the, the way we explain it, well, alhamdulillah. Um, then the Shaykh, he also says that a person's wealth in general is always of benefit to him, right? Our wealth it should be of benefit to us in this dunya. For example, 
Um, when you get hungry, you can buy something to eat. You need a place to stay, is to sleep over. You can use your wealth to rent and so forth. Your money, your wealth, and so forth is obviously of benefit to you in various ways, right? But Allah says here that His mal, maluhu, His wealth, His money, His wealth will not be of benefit to Him. And what's meant here is, yani in front of Allah, it will not be of benefit. Perhaps in this dunya, He'll get. Benefits out of it, yeah, and they just like eating and buying food and buying some shelter and, and so forth, right? Some dunya we benefits here and there, perhaps, no problem. But will this wealth be of any benefit to him in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is what Allah is negating completely. And this is why Ibn Uthaymin says the benefit that does not, any benefit that does not save a person from the hellfire is in reality of no benefit. Any benefit, any favor that we have in this dunya, right? And this week, this, this statement of the sheikh can really be applied to anything, not just man, not just wealth. Take your health, for example. Take your body, for example. Take anything. It's a benefit. There's lots of benefits in it. There's lots of things we can do with our body, with our health, with our physicality, with different things, with our mind, with our tongue. So many benefits. But if these benefits does not save the person from the fire of the hellfire, from the fire of hell, or from the hellfire, then in reality it is of no benefit. Because in front of Allah, when we meet Allah, these things are not going to be of benefit to us. In fact, it will be a, a, a proof against us, Allah Musta'an. So that statement can really be interpreted according to any, any benefit that we ex experience. And in this context, of course, it's wealth. So our wealth may benefit us in this dunya, but if it's not going to save us from the fire of Jahannam, then that in reality there is no benefit in that wealth. In reality there is no benefit in that, in that wealth, Allah Musta'an. So the Muslim, of course, he should be intelligent. And he should make, make his life such in that, in, that, that, that he earns halal income, number one. That he spends his money wisely, without wasting, without investing in haram, without investing in riba without um, hoarding, without being greedy, but he has to be balanced. He has to be balanced, and he gives in sadaqah, and he pays his zakah, and so forth. So that at least his wealth is, alhamdulillah, of a, as, is that of a benefit to him. And he will, will perhaps save him come the akhirah. And that's why the one hadith says, you should give charity, right? Or save yourself from the fire. Save yourself from the fire, even if it means by giving one day in charity. Subhanallah. So, in that way, our wealth will be of benefit to us. For example, when we give charity, we spend on our families, we pay our zakah, we invest only in halal, we avoid haram in uh, transactions and so forth. In this way, we are fearing Allah. And through that, Allah will bless us, and Allah will guide us, and Allah will forgive us, and it will save us on the day of Qiyamah, bi'idhnillah ta'ala. Regarding his earnings, the word kasab usually refers to earnings in Arabic, but here yeah, many of the scholars like Ibn Abbas and others said that kasab means children. So the ayah mentioned his wealth, it will be of benefit to him. And kasab, the ayah ended off kasab. Ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab, no he is kasab. So some of the scholars like Ibn Abbas and many others, they said that kasab actually refers to his children, that they also will be of no benefit to him. And to, to strengthen this view, there's a hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna atyaba ma akaltum min kasbikum wa inna awladakum min kasbikum. Indeed, the most wholesome of what you consume is from your earnings. The, most, the best of what you can consume and eat, for example, is from what you have earned, from your own hands. This is what that basically means. Wa inna awladakum min kasbikum. And indeed, your children are from your earnings. They are from your kasb. They are from your kasb. So this strengthens the view that says that the word kasab here means your children. It means his children. That they also will be of no benefit. That is one of the views of the ulama. Right? Um, also, it has been mentioned from Ibn Mas'ud that when the Rasulullah, when the, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called his people to iman, Abu Lahab said, even if what my nephew says is true, and yeah, look at the arrogance. 
Even if what my nephew says is true, I will ransom myself from the painful torment on the day of judgment with my wealth and my children, my kasb. And therefore Allah Azza wa Jal revealed ma aghna anhu ma duhu wa ma kasab. So he, out of his arrogance, he said, even if what he calling to is the truth, I'm not going to submit. I refuse to accept. This was his kibir. This was his arrogance. And what will I do? If it's the truth, then I will ransom myself. I'll save myself from the fire, or from the punishment in the akhirah, on the punishment of Qiyamah, for example, with my wealth and my children. Meaning, because he thought he had wealth and because he was a man of status and his children and so forth, he will use them to ransom himself and that will be his savior. And so Allah said what? مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَا لُهُ وَمَا كَسَبَتْ مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَا لُهُ وَمَا كَسَبَتْ Neither his wealth nor his children or his gains will, will benefit him. So this is how he do, deluded he was. On the point of his children, so here if we say it means his children, then just let's look at one of his sons. One of his sons was Utaybah. Remember we said earlier his, his surname, but should, it, should have been his kunya, not his surname. His kunya is Abu Utaybah, because this was his eldest son, Utaybah. Utaybah, the son of Abu Lahab. Who was Utaybah? What happened? What's this, the, the short story we have about Utaybah? Utaybah, by the way, was married to Umm Kulthum, radiallahu anha, who was the daughter of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this was before prophethood. Before prophethood, remember, they are their family, right? So they, of course, know each other. This is Rasulullah's cousin, right? It's his uncle's son. It's his first cousin, uh, Utaybah. So Utaybah marries his daughter, who is Umm Kulthum, radiallahu anha. And then after prophethood, he decides he wants nothing to do with him, and he divorces Umm Kulthum, right? So that marriage is now over. And one day he even attacks Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he ends up tearing his shirt and so forth. There was a scuffle and he attacked him, right? Because the enmity had now grown because only because of the da'wah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was giving. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made a dua. And he said, Allahumma sallit alayhi kalban min kilabikum. Oh Allah, sit one of your beast upon him. Right? The word used is kalb. Now, usually we know kalb means a dog, right? But actually kalb in Arabic can also refer to any predatory beast. Any predatory beast that, you know, can attack people and bite people and so forth. <clears throat> so he said, oh Allah, sit one of your beasts upon him. And so one day this man, Utaybah, the son of Abu Lahab, he went on a journey with a caravan with some people and as they stopped over they were on their way to Sham they stopped over for the, on this journey to rest and to spend the night and so forth and he was full of fear and he acknowledged this fear to his companions and his friends and he said to them I actually fear the dua of Muhammad I'm worried about the dua of Muhammad and so they said to him don't worry and they you know unpacked the things and they surrounded him so they sat around him and they packed the things around him as if to protect him. And then what happened was is the narration says that a lion appeared and this lion attacked him, bit him and killed him. Allah musta'an. Subhanallah. <clears throat> this was the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being accepted. This is just one of the sons of who? Abu Lahab. One of the stories. The thing he thought these, this, is what, this is what will save him. His sons will save him. But what did Allah say? There will be of no benefit to him. So that's what kasab means according to that view. Kasab here, according to the first view, is refers to his children. His wealth will not be of benefit, nor his kasab, nor his children. However, Shaykh Ibn Uthaymi, rahimahullah, argues and says that kasab is not just his children. It's more general and more inclusive than that. Right? So he says that the verse includes his offspring. Yes, kasab means his offspring, yes. But it also includes other things. Right? It also includes, for example, his wealth that he would earn in the future. That's not yet part of his wealth, but whatever he earns in the future, he also part of part of kasab. And also it includes his honor and his status. Remember, these are honorable people in the community, people of status. The sons of Abdul Muttalib, the leaders of the Quraysh. 
So whatever status he has, whatever honor he has, for example, whatever he gains of increase in status and honor, none of these things will benefit him. So the Sheikh argues that the word kasab is not restricted to offspring or children, rather it includes the, the meaning of offspring and children, but it's much more gentle than that. It, it, it includes any worldly gain, right? Any worldly gain. Hence, if you look at the translation, the translation is pretty accurate, be where it said, neither his wealth nor worldly gains will be of benefit to him. Any gain, not just restricted to, to that of children, and Allah Azza wa Jal ultimately knows best. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Sayasla naran dhata lahab. Sayasla naran dhata lahab. He will burn in a flaming fire. A fire that is lahab. Remember what we said about lahab means flames. Burning, blazing. Right? Like his face. And that is where he will be. Okay? He will burn sayasla naran in a fire that is dhata lahab. That is, that is burning and blazing. Wallahu musta'an. So this is his abode. He claimed he will be saved. Allah is telling us no ways. He said his sons and his wealth will save him. Allah said no ways. He cursed the Prophet may, may you perish. May your hands be perished and so forth. Allah said may, you, may your hands be perished. May the hands of Abu Lahab be perished. And may he be perished. Subhanallah. Ibn Kathir says meaning the fire it has flames. Evil and severe burning. That Allah he says it means it has flames, it is evil and severe in its burning. And here Ibn Rafaymin also mentions a powerful point where he says, if you look at the word sayasla, that scene at the beginning of the word yasla is a scene that attached to the sa. Okay? That sa in Arabic is used usually for the future. Right? And the close a future that's not too far away. Usually, that's how it's used in the Arabic language. So, for example, um, we said in Arabic, "Sa'adhab ila al-masjid." I will go to the masjid. I will go soon to the masjid. Not "adhab ila sa'adhab." You add that scene in front of a, a, a verb. It will mean that I will shortly be going to the masjid. For example, I will. I'm planning to go to the masjid shortly. For example, this is how that scene can be used, right? And there the sheikh says here yeah, that sayasla means it indicates that this is something that will happen soon. That he will burn in a blazing a flaming fire. Sayasla meaning it's going to happen in the not too distant future. It's going to happen soon. As if to say it's a reality and it's coming soon. It's coming soon for him. And there the sheikh says that is because no matter how long one stays in this dunya, or how much delight he experiences in this dunya, the year after is nearby. Wallahu musta'an. Even those in the barzakh. No matter how many years have passed them by, it is only like one hour. In reality. In the bigger picture. In the reality of things. And think about the barzakh. You know, we think about our life on this earth, we think we have a long time, we think we have that life is maybe long, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, some people live 90, 100 maybe, very, very day, but it happens. Is that a long life? We may think it's a long life, we may think, subhanAllah, we're 30 years old, 35, 40 years old, we still got 20 years left, perhaps Allah knows best, but you know, most likely 20 years left. And we think it's a long time, but in reality, it's not a long time. Because number one, time flies, yes. But secondly, our time is very short and limited. And if you compare it to the Barzakh, right? Take any person in history. Take the Sahaba. Take Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 1400 and, what's it now, 30 years perhaps, he, uh, approximately, he passed away. 430 odd years. 32, 33 years. He passed away. Sahaba, similar time periods, some of them before that, some of them after that. And take the other prophets even before him. Adam, Hawa, Sulaiman, Dawood, Ibrahim, Nuh, Subhanallah. And those people have passed away, these Anbiya and people before them and with them have passed away hundreds and thousands of years ago. Where have they been? Where are they? They're in the Barzakh. This next life, which is the, the life between this life and the year after, they are in their graves. 
their bodies and their souls go to the Barzakh. How long have they been there? For all of this time. How long are they still going to be there? Only Allah Azza wa Jalla knows. Wallahu a'lam. So if we pass away today, tomorrow, even in 50 years from now, we only have that time in this dunya to prepare for the akhirah. We will then go into the barzakh. How long are we going to be in the barzakh? Maybe a thousand years. Maybe two thousand years. Our state in the barzakh depends on our state, the way that we lived. If we lived with iman, our state in the barzakh will be sweet and happy and full of delight. And we will be begging for the akhirah. Longing for the and of course the opposite holds true, Allah Musta'an. But even those people who spend thousands of years in the Barzakh, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran? Surah Al Ahqaf, verse 35. On the day they see what they have been threatened with. On that day, this is what the threat this is what we threatened you with. On that day, come Qiyamah, when you finally see it happening. It will be as if they had only stayed in this world or wherever they were before the Akhirah, which includes the Barzakh, for an hour of a day. Sa'atan min nahar. In the entire life, whatever happened before that day, which includes this life of this world and the Barzakh, all of that will seem like one hour, even if it's 10,000 years, even if in reality it's 5,000, 2,000, 1,000 years, and, and only Allah knows best how long it will be. It will seem like, Allah says, Sa'atan min nahar, like one hour of the day. Wallahu musta'an. So this is why Allah, uh, should I say, Ibn Uthaymi rahimahullah is saying that it's something that's very nearby. It's coming to, to you, O oh, Abu Lahab. Wa mara'atuhu hammalat al hatab. And so will his wife, the carrier of thorny, thorny kindling. Hammalat al-Hatab. Hatab actually means wood, right? So kindling, yani kindling for the fire, it's wood. Thorny kindling. You'll see why the translator used this word thorny. <coughs> so this means, Ibn Kathir says, she will carry the firewood. Yani, in the akhirah, in Jahannam. She will carry the firewood and throw it upon her husband. To increase that which he is in of torment, and she will be ready and prepared to do so. So she will be there with him, and she will also be carrying firewood and throwing in more and more, killing that fire more and more, so that his, his punishment gets increased. Another reason, one other interpretation here, is that why is she called the one who carried the firewood, the one who carried that thorny wood, that thorny kindling? It is because. This woman used to carry <clears throat> wood and she used to throw these thorny pieces of wood and branches into the pathway of the Prophet ﷺ in order to harm him. So she knew that this is where he stayed, this is where he used to go, this is where the Kaaba is, and this is on his way to the Kaaba and so forth. She would go out and fetch these wood these branches, right, which is full of thorns and was sharp and so forth, and she would purposely throw it in these place, spots where she knew that he would walk, hoping that he's going to walk on it and that he gets harmed. This is what she would do, right? And that's why Allah then says, masad. Around her neck will be a rope of palm fiber. Around her neck will be a rope of palm fiber. And Mujahid and Urwa both said from the palm fiber of the fire. Not like the dunya. Her punishment will be that rope of palm fiber which is thorny and prickly and sharp and it will also be from the fire. <clears throat> and Mujahid also said this means a color of iron. So this is what she will have. And this is why I think even Kathir says don't you see that the Arabs call a pulley cable a masad. A masad. It's one of the words of, of Masad, subhanAllah. And this is also described, this also describes her in the dunya. This ayah, fi jidiha hablu min Masad, around her neck will be a rope of palm fiber. We can apply to the akhirah and say she will have this like the color of iron, according to Mujahid, or she will have that palm fiber around her neck from the fire, burning her in the fire like that. Or it's also a description of how she was in the dunya. Because as we said, she would go out to the Sahara, to the desert, go out 
far out of you know out of the city and into the desert to go find these branches, to go find these thorny branches, and she would tie a rope around her neck and carry it like that, and then come to throw it in the pathway of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in order to harm him. So imagine this is a woman of status. This is supposed to be an honorable woman in the community, but this is what she would go and do to herself. Go out into the desert, go find these things, tie it around her neck and drag it and try and this is how Allah humiliated her. This is how Allah humiliated her because of what she was doing or trying to do to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this ayah could either apply to how she was in this world doing what she did or it can be applied to how she's going to be punished in the akhirah with that fiber or the palm fibers, thorny palm fibers which will be tied around her neck and she'll be burnt by that like an color of iron as Mujahid said or palm fibers from the from the fire of Jahannam Wallahu al-Musta'an and also she is the carrier of the fire which means either of the wood sorry either it, it applies to us again a state in the dunya of how she carried it to harm the Prophet or it applies to how she will carry it in the fire and she will then be throwing more and more wood kindling the fire for her husband Abu Lahab and they will both burn like that Wallahu al-Musta'an Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anhu, she narrates a story to us that shows us how this woman, the wife of Abu Lahab, tried to harm the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. So when these ayat tabbat yada Abi Lahab were revealed, and we spoke about why it was revealed, what Abu Lahab said and so forth, when these ayat were revealed, may the hands of Abu Lahab perish and may he be perished, this woman, the one-eyed Umm Jamil, she was one-eyed, right? Uh, she was called Umm Jamil bint Harb, the daughter of Harb. She came out wailing. Remember, these people didn't even believe in the Quran. Now the ayat come out re rebuking her and her husband and she comes out wailing. And she had a rock in her hand. And she was saying, he criticizes our father and his religion is our son and his command is to disobey us. Of course, talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and as we said, this is what they used to say about him. His father or our fathers and our religion, and his command is to just, this is why they couldn't handle him, because of their arrogance. And so that at that time, the Prophet sallallahu is sitting in the haram, near the Kaaba with Abu Bakr, as siddiq radiallahu anhu. This is his daughter, by the way, who narrates the story, Asma bint Abu Bakr, who is of course the sister of Aisha, radiallahu anha, the daughter of Abu Bakr. And when Abu Bakr saw her coming, he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, she is coming, and I fear that she will see you. Meaning, he knew, could hear what she's shouting and saying and wailing about. She has a rock in her hand. And they knew she's not a, a she's not a, a trustworthy or moral woman. She's an immoral person. So she cannot be trusted. So she says to the Prophet, I fear she's coming to harm you. You know, maybe you should get up and leave. So the Prophet said, Inna lantarani. Indeed, she will not be able to see me. She is not going to see me. And then he recited some of the Quran as a protection for himself. This is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ جَعَلْنَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ حِجَابًا مَسْتُورًا And when you recite the Qur'an, we put between you and those who believe not in the Akhirah, an invisible veil. Subhanallah. So he recited ayat to protect himself. And Allah says here that when you recite the Qur'an, Allah puts a veil between you and those who don't believe in the Akhirah. And so this woman came and she came until she was standing in front of Abu Bakr and she did not see the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she then said to Abu Bakr, to Abu Bakr, Oh Abu Bakr, indeed I have been informed that your friend is making defamatory poetry about me. He's saying things about us. Abu Bakr said, no, that the Lord of the Kaaba, he is not defaming you. And so she took his word, right? And other narration says, I believe you and you are someone trustworthy. And so she left. And so she left saying, <clears throat> she left saying, indeed the Quraysh know that I am the daughter of the leader. This is what, how she, she consoled herself. You know, as if to say, this, these Quraysh's, they know I am the daughter of the leader, meaning they, they must still fear me and respect me. So he's not, he won't be defaming me and so forth. And so she left. Abu Bakr then said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, she couldn't see you? Faith, yani how could she not see you? And the Prophet said, there was an angel here who was covering me with his wings. There was an angel here who was covering me with his wings, subhanallah. 
So that brings us, alhamdulillah, to the end of the surah, Surah Al-Masad, right? Wherein we spoke about the reason of the prohibition. Rasul called Quraysh, would you believe me? And I said, this the enemy is about to attack you. They said, yes. He said, I'm warning you only about the most of your torment. Abu, Bal- uh, Abu Lahab then said, is this what you gathered us for? May you be perished. And Allah then, in defense of his messenger, revealed and said, may the hands of Abu Lahab be perished and may he be perished. And truly he was perished. And ma aghna anhu malu ma kasab. May his wealth nor any worldly benefit be of any benefit to him. Any worldly gains be of benefit to him. And this we explain that in the akhirah especially, his wealth will not avail him in front of Allah. Nor any of his benefits, not his money, not his status, not his offspring. <clears throat> and we spoke about his offspring. They will be thrown into the fire, a blazing fire, a flaming fire that will be severe upon him. That's coming soon. And his wife as well, the carrier of the thorny kindling firewood. Right? She will be stoking the fire for him and burning with him. And likewise, she carried it in his dunya. And her neck will be a rope of palm fiber from the palm trees. Right? Again, she carried it in this dunya on her neck to, to hurt the Prophet And likewise, in the Akhirah, she'll be given the color of iron, of palm fiber from the fire, where she'll be dragged from her neck and be punished like this, subhanAllah. So this is the status of the enemies of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how Allah azza wa jal condemned them, and how he punishes them, and he will punish them in the Akhirah, Allah musta'an, and how he defended his, uh, his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from these people. So that's the end of the surah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Um, next week, bi'idhnillah, we move on to surah al-ikhlas, bi'idhnillah, one of the most powerful and the best surahs in the Quran. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Until then, bi'idhnillah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.